After five centuries of conflict, five decades of hostilities, and five years of ambiguity. The Americans have towards Cuba something called an obsessive disorder. Has change finally come to Cuba? A new as Cuban relations? And here we are in Havana looking for answers. Cuba is a tiny lizard, and we have very near an enormous dragon. We survive the continuous harassment by the U.S. government. Is Cuba the test of a new U.S. policy towards the Americas? We travel through Washington, Miami, and Havana to debate their opposing claims. Will they face the music or continue to dance around the issues? I am Marwan Bishara, and this is Empire. They are the mafiosos. They took control of a rich, powerful country and turned it into the most poor and miserable country in the hemisphere. So why is life expectancy in Cuba the third highest in all of Latin America? They don't know how to run their economy. They don't know how to build a country. They don't know how to govern a people. Yet the literacy rate is the highest in all of the Americas, south and north. With your wonderful literacy skills, are you allowed to read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal? Because the answer is no. So it's great to have literacy, but if you don't have access to the information, what's the point of it? The American embargo. Embargo, blockade, pressure, terrorism. But how important it is to make sure we stare down the Castro regime and we do nothing that helps embolden the Castro regime. The Castro regime has never blinked, not once. But it has forced the Cuban people into some very peculiar ways of coping. All the bikes are before revolution. 50s, 40s. The child is not only from the father who made it, but the father who grew up with the child. These motorcycles are Cuban because they grew up here in Cuba. Cuban economy today is being kept afloat by Venezuelan subsidies of free oil. What does Cuba export in return? Today, we have around 50,000 health workers, 42% are doctors. There are great doctors that they have in Cuba, and I'm no doubt they're very talented. I've met a bunch of them. You know where I met them? In the United States, because they defected. And yet, in Mississippi, USA, life expectancy is lower. Literacy is much lower. Infant mortality is twice as high. The murder rate is higher, and the number of people per thousand in prison is higher. And yet, Cuba has real and severe problems. On the issue of economics, we have a disastrous economic situation. Well, if you walk the streets of Havana, people want change. People are desperate for change. We've made many mistakes. We forgot about the market. You cannot have an economy that works if you don't take into account the market forces. In 2008, Fidel Castro, in ill health, turned over the government to his brother, Raul. Raul surprised the world by immediately admitting mistakes and announcing changes. The enormous efforts required to strengthen the economy, this is an essential premise if we are to forge ahead in any other area of our society. Cuba is now allowing Cuban Americans to invest in Cuba. I think it's been about three years since they began to allow people to open their own private business. Cuba is opening up to the world, and I think things will change. Buying a computer was legalized in 2007, and cell phones too. Now there are over two million in Cuba. Athletes get additional income. But does an extra $20 a month mean you've turned pro? 
musicians are making money. Here in Cuba, there is purchasing power to buy tickets for concerts, but also you can make money playing all venues like bars and nightclubs. Is Cuba really going to change? In what ways? How will they do it? And how far will they go? Will it be two steps forward and one step back? We are in Havana and are joined by Arnaldo Coro Antich, a popular radio show host in Cuba. Orailda Cabrera Gutierrez, former ambassador and a fellow with the Cuban Institute of Friendship with the Peoples. And Mark Frank, a foreign correspondent with Reuters and author of Cuban Revelations Behind the Scenes in Havana. I began by asking if recent changes in Cuba are irreversible. It's irreversible because it's very well planned, very well organized, very well fought. And it has received acceptance by the majority of the population. So what for you is, are the important changes? The most important changes is the change in mental attitude for inserting Cuba into the world. In a way... You mean Cuba opening to the world? To the world in a way that it would be perfectly accepted not only by Cuba and the Cubans living here, but by the Cubans abroad and by people around the world. Okay, but before we get to the world, how far is Cuba opening to Cubans? Well, there are many things that, uh, say, a year ago were inimaginable that today are everyday practice. And that has uh, developed, for example, entrepreneurship among many people. That was something that was hidden and it is coming up. You think it's really irreversible, the change in, in Cuba? Yeah, I, I think it's completely irreversible. First of all, because the changes are based on a criticism of what was before. Cuba's gone from basically denying its own problems and, so, and only really blaming the outside world to very consistently now since 2006, the leadership has insisted on looking and for the people to look at their own problems and do whatever is necessary to overcome them up to the point of establishing, you know, tomorrow a, a capitalist country. So, 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 but there are reports uh, from outside so, Cuba. So, you know, so but there are, outside, but, but there are reports from outside Cuba that speak of a thousand dissidents being in prison this very last year. Well, the, the first thing that I would like to say is that uh, dissidents are financed from abroad. All? Practically all of them. Oh. And, and I think that, that that's uh, something that it's very, very bad for them, actually. But is that demonizing them or is that fact? I'm not demonizing them. Mm. I'm just saying that they, in one way or another, they receive financing from abroad and support from abroad. And that and discredits them? Of course. Mm. That's essential. If, if the, the, their uh, dissent will come from honesty and saying something that uh, they don't like and use the way of expressions which are open in many, many ways here, then it would be different. We don't want the model of a society to be imported from somewhere. Mm. We have a very peculiar, particular way of doing things here. Oh, you actually work with grassroots here mm -hmm. in some way, in some form or another. Do you think they benefit as much from the change that is going on and hence they are on board with it? I think they are the, the people, the grassroots, are the ones who really receive more benefit for that. And I would like to just to say briefly, this is irreversible because this start, those changes starting with the discussion with everybody since the bottom to the top. And it was, everybody was expressing what do they feel because we the Cubans really have voice. But everything and we are critic. But we criticize, but in a good manner, just looking for the best. Hmm. not looking for create situations inside of the country, but manipulated. But we, we're, we're basically talking about economic change, about change in the economic system within the country, social, right? Hmm. But how, is that really possible to develop if there is no political opening in the country? It is because the government is opening also, it's changing, it's moving hmm. together hmm. with this international situation that is moving, it's improving. We are an island, so we are totally openly. It's very hard to say how things will develop. They're just beginning a process of change. The change is very important because it's changing the relationship of the government to the people from a paternalistic type of system. So we have to see the Cubans are very intelligent people. 
And as they evolve over the next 10 or 15 years, they're gonna have to look at what kind of system they still want. But, but what, right now, it's a one-party system as they go through these But changes. what I'm curious about, and for you, Frank, and, and, uh, and Coro, and, and of course, uh, for all of us, if Cuba has done so well, so well on education, on health, uh -huh. on life expectancy, yeah. but it has not done well on economic growth. Well, I think you have to also look at the difference between 30 years ago and now. They went through a very serious crisis. By the time they had gone through the serious crisis, they had already built up with Soviet help a tremendous education system and a tremendous health care system. And so they had something to skate on in a way, um, which has helped them get through this period. I think it's tremendously important to understand when the Soviet Union and the socialist countries just collapsed, evaporated, disappeared. We were doing trade on very beneficial terms with those nations and this suddenly collapsed in a matter of weeks. Now, the problem is, and this is, this is what I, I think it's essential, the problem is the fact, the real fact, that we survived despite this problem and the continuous harassment by the U.S. government. So you think the economic lack of growth in Cuba is also caused by U.S.? The U.S. has a definite, a definite influence in harassing every company that wants to do business with Cuba. And this has aspects that are very inhumane. For example, if Cuba needs to buy a certain pharmaceutical that is essential for doing surgery on children, then the company is banned by the U.S. government to sell that product to Cuba. The pressure is on every day. It's, it's a tremendous pressure. If, if it continues to open up towards international companies and those ones with the state and so on, and it continues to open up to society. What is the danger that Cuba will start losing the best of its achievements, its good health, its good education, its life expectancy, and so on? That's why we will not change our system. Because so one of the best things, the system, the socialist system, because it must be clear for everybody. My Cuba? perception is that uh, changes will be coming gradually and intelligently. And this is what has been happening. But what I'm curious about, will this be, will this be sustained when, uh, I don't know, uh, Barclays Bank and Citibank returns to Cuba? You have to do it scientifically because the society needs scientific direction. It cannot be directed by just doing like this and say, the wind is blowing from the south. You need an anemometer and Back. a wind vane. In the formation of the American empire, most American political leaders thought that Cuba was vital for the American empire. Thomas Jefferson said, we ought at the first opportunity take Cuba. John Quincy Adams had a theory. There are laws of political as well as of physical gravitation. An apple cannot choose but fall to the ground. I call it the ripe fruit syndrome. Is, is a belief that the United States has to control Cuba. By 1898, Washington decided that the fruit had to be ripe. Historians say that Americans blew the, their own ship in order to justify their invasion of Cuba. We were a banana republic before the revolution. <laughs> Washington decided that Fidel was a communist. The biggest military parade ever staged in Cuba, featuring tanks and other heavy weapons from Russia and Red Czechoslovakia. There is a limit to what the United States and self-respect can endure. That limit has now been reached. It was war. Attack. Cold war, hot war, economic war, espionage war. The U.S. fought the Cubans. I welcome the opportunity of having anyone uh, assassinate Fidel Castro. Cuba fought back. I am a soldier of the revolution. Yes, then and now. had a new export, 
revolution. They say we exported the revolution. Here, there weren't revolution factories to give to other countries. We didn't even buy arms. Our brothers asked for help, and we came to their aid. Today, this is revolutionary Cuba, the country that has done so much for the peoples of Africa. Now the Cold War is history, ancient history. Yet the conflict remains. There is a new divide. It's between the North and the South. Cuba, it acts like America. It drives like America. It sounds like America. Entonces, cobola. So what's the problem? I asked Cuban TV host Rinaldo Taladrid Herrero and Mark Frank if Cuba's troubles are a result of America's boycott. Some people use it in Cuba to hide their failures, but embargo or blockade, as you prefer, is a, re is a real thing. It damaged the Cuban economy. You agree? Well, look, I know a lot of international bankers um, and right now, there's no question, the pressure on them to not do business with Cuba is greater than ever, in part because Cuba's on the terrorist list. But they all say the same. Why is Cuba um, the, on the terrorist list? I have absolutely, there's no reason. Nobody really has a good answer. We all agree. I don't know anybody really who doesn't say it's a political you want question. Bite? Cuba is sending doctors, no military advisors. Cuba is sending, is sending uh, uh, teachers, doctors, no weapons to all Latin American countries. What, what, is, what is that kind of thing, so, an action so against the United States? If Telegrid is right and, and, and uh, Cuba is just exporting doctors, then what is the problem with Washington? Why is Washington still oh. have this problem? My answer is that that's a very important factor. But there's historic reasons as well. No other country has ever done to the United States what Cuba did. And the fact is, in that sense, the embargoes worked because no country in Latin America or Caribbean would ever do again what Cuba did. It's also true that it's a different time. But if you look at the revolutionary processes, if you want to call that, in Latin America now, in Bolivia, Ecuador, they're not nationalizing everything. If the American embargo failed, then why is, are we blaming America's boycott on Cuba's troubles? It's not correct to blame the American embargo for all the problems. But what is the problem with what Cuba has? A lot of problems in economy, in buildings, in society. What is the problem with and that? The, These and, are Cuban problems mm -hmm. for the Cubans, not for the United States government. A, a Latin American millionaire once asked me, what is the original sin? Because I don't understand. What is the original sin that provoked all this situation? In, in the, in the 21th century, for example, one, one government has the right to reject or to accept any kind of politics of any kind of government. It's the right, no? In any part of the world. Why is the thing if Cuba accept or not accept any kind of politics? So, 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 so you actually think that the boycott remains what it is and the relations are not normalized because of Washington, not because of Havana? Absolutely. Cuba is ready to talk, but talk not to unconditional surrender. But countries? Telegrid, already Obama said mutual respect and mutual interest. Raul Castro said civilized dialogue. What is mutual respect for America, for example? Uh, you have to organize elections with different, multi multiple parties, no? Okay, and what about Saudi Arabia? There are no political parties, no elections, and it's an ally, not just a friend. Look, Cuba is a tiny lizard, and we have very near an enormous dragon. If you're a little lizard and you have a big dragon trying to destroy you, you can live in an ideal world if nothing, if nothing is happening. And, and then the, even the Cuban political system was built and designed to protect Cuba against, against the big dragon. The day the big dragon desists, okay, I don't want to destroy you anymore. I don't want to interfere in your house. Hmm? Okay, I am sure many things will change. Do you think President Obama sees uh, the relationship with Cuba as the one between the dragon and the lizard? Yes, I, I, because that's just objective. It's not really a question of ideology. The fact is, Cuba is just very small. I mean, some people call it an elephant in a mouse. Some people call it, but it's certainly there. So 
So he's running that country, and I think he what he does understand, just like Kerry, and just like actually the head of the Pentagon, they've all said it in the past before they had position. They feel the embargo has failed, and they need another strategy. So you think it's pragmatism? It's, of course it's pragmatism. So the, the, the goal is still the same, but the means have changed? That's right, uh, that's right. The, the same, a new strategy is for what? For overthrow a foreign government by different means. Yeah, I always say the most important change right now in Cuba is the, the dialogue going on between Cubans on the island and off. And there's a tremendous national discussion going on here under the table that you don't see about what kind of country all those Cubans want Cuba to be. But the new guys, when they arrive to Miami or Florida, they don't want to be involved in politics. Less than 20% of them would register to vote. You don't think Washington, when it's allowed for that kind of influx of Cuban Americans into Cuba, there was a goal behind the mean, meaning they want to change Cuba from from the bottom of Obama expressed it. When Obama presented his new policy toward Cuba, it was in, two, in the campaign of 2008. He said, I'm going to authorize unrestricted travel and remittances to all Cuban Americans to Cuba. But the second part of the phrase was not in the big media. He said, and not only because humanitarian reasons, because they are a very powerful tool of our goals to a new Cuba. 60% of the American people yeah. now want to lift the embargo. Is it Washington or is it Havana that is pushing the brakes on normalization? No, 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 no. Havana will not. It's totally false that Havana wants that the embargo will keep in place. It's not true. So there is change in the United States. There is change in Cuba. Why isn't there change in Cuban-American relations? Did you think that for, for, for an internal decision of US policy, it's important what the rest of the world thinks? Did you really? Think they are, they are really concerned that the Latin American countries will not go to a summit without Cuba? Yes. Did you really think it's so important for them? You don't think America has become I, more isolated because of Cuba in, in, in South Absolutely. America? Absolutely. No, in, in all Latin America. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But my question is how many times the U.S. government did incur what the world thinks about anything? They no, just care about numbers, elections, internal politics, and they don't care. You have to remember that, yes, the U.S. is big and bad and everything else but they have normal relations with everybody else in the Western Hemisphere. It seems to me that then there is a good number of influential people, both in Havana and Washington, that are still stuck in the Cold War, at least the Cold War mindset. It's not the Cold War mentality. It's a total lack of trust on both sides. That's what there is. Um, and, and that is, continues to exist, both on the U.S. side and the Cuban side. And not just at the top, at all levels. You know, which, and that's but, but the Mark, problem. Mark, Back to your dragon and lizard. It's much easier for the dragon to trust the lizard than the lizard to trust that's, the dragon. That's what I'm saying. Everybody what did. kind of damage the lizard could inflict the dragon? There is a government in Cuba, a legal government. They can't recognize that there is a legal government, a legal system in Cuba, and they didn't accept that. They only accept unconditional surrender. This is not a negotiation. Miami and Washington are next where we ask about America's obsession with Cuba. It's necessary to U.S. foreign policy in its larger picture to demonize Cuba. I think that uh, Cuba policy, you can characterize it as benign neglect. I want to say a few words to the captive people of Cuba. I have watched, and the American people have watched, with deep sorrow, how your nationalist revolution was betrayed. If I can be convinced that Cuba wants to remove their aggravating influence. Trade with Cuba will merely enrich Fidel Castro. The Americans have towards Cuba something called an obsessive disorder. Why? Our real goal there is to ultimately have Cuba become a democracy. As a Cold War policy, it was at least coherent a common sense policy to bring about democracy in Cuba, a country 90 miles away, 45 minutes away from the Florida coast. The military threat is over. Their ideological war has been won. Unjust, incoherent, US politics towards Cuba, it's, uh, it's a thing of the past. And yet... The public uh, voices uh, 
in Congress uh, that represent the Cuban American community still believe in the embargo that hasn't achieved the, the objective of uh, overthrowing the Castro regime for the past 50 years or so. U.S. policy continues to be regime change. I look forward to the day when we can lift the embargo, but that needs to happen after we've restored freedom to Cuba, after the tyranny ends. In 2009, America's new president reached out. I didn't come here to debate the past. I came here to deal with the future. Cuba's new leader responded. We've told the North American government, in private and in public, that we are prepared, wherever they want, to discuss everything. Then they shook hands at Nelson Mandela's funeral. When the leader of the free world shakes the bloody hand of a ruthless dictator like Raul Castro, uh, Raul Castro uses that hand to sign the orders to repress and jail democracy advocates. But you want us to change. Why doesn't the Cuban government change? But Cuba has been changing. In Cuba, you could be Catholic, Protestant, practice Afro-Cuban culture, communist and homosexual at the same time without problems. But Cuba remains on the terrorist watch list. The Cuban people still live in constant fear of a brutal totalitarian regime that has demonstrated time and again its utter disregard for basic human dignity. What do the American hardliners, the conservatives, the Miami Cubans want? Will they accept anything less than a return to the good old days? When everything was for sale, even the president, especially the president, polls agree everyone wants change. But American policy seems stuck in the past. Attesting to Cuba's conquest by communist imperialism. Doing the same things that have failed for 50 years. The Cuban drama goes on. Is Washington in the grip of a leftover ideology? The U.S. government has, has, has provided over $200 million to Cuban-American organizations in South Florida. It became an industry. How can a group of angry expatriates in a rage left over from 1958 hold the foreign policy of the entire United States hostage. Miami has become, uh, for many years, the center of the organized opposition by Cuban exiles to the Castro government. A significant minority that comes out to vote over a single issue, like the anti-Castro Cuban Americans, they can provide the margin of victory. And winning Florida usually means winning the presidency. Obama can do it. Obama can do it if he wants. Still has time. Can this president make the changes all by himself? By executive order? The current situation cannot change unless Congress lifts the embargo. Is American foreign policy towards Cuba the place where reason goes to die? <laughs> we are in Washington and are joined by Avi Chomsky, a historian of Latin America at Salem State University in Massachusetts. Philip Brunner, a specialist on U.S. foreign policy towards Latin America at the American University and author of A Contemporary Cuban Leader, The Revolution Under Raul Castro. Mike Gonzalez from the Heritage Foundation and former U.S. State Department official. And last but not least, Mark Weisbrot, an expert on Latin America at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. I began by asking what the view is from Washington. I don't think there's much thinking in Washington about Cuba. In fact, a few years ago, the, uh, the number two person in the, uh, the Latin American Bureau visited Cuba for the first time, and she her first remark when someone said, what did you learn? She said, people laugh here, they smile. I was so surprised by that. So I think they largely don't think much about Cuba, know much about Cuba. They're not looking at the changes, Avi, of what's going on in there? Keeping track of them? They're keeping track of them, but, but I would agree with Phil that I don't think it's a high priority issue. I don't think the administration feels that it has much to gain with engaging in the issue. I don't think that the Obama administration wants to ruffle any feathers about Cuba. I don't think it has anything to gain by doing so. Uh, I think that uh, 
Cuba policy, you can characterize it as benign neglect. Uh, if a, an American president had been serious about Cuba, or had Cuba had risen to a priority, uh, Cuba would have been free many decades ago. Uh, Cuba is, uh, there are people here who do know about the situation in Cuba, about uh, the, uh, the changes that, that have taken place, uh, the, the, the increase in arrests, in, in reported uh, documented arrests, uh, the, the increase in, um, in, in, in uh, repression. But you know what there is in Cuba? There is an intersection, uh, interest section for the U.S. Uh, a diplomatic mission. A diplomatic yeah. mission with, with at least 70 or something diplomats. So they must be doing, following something. No, they know what's going on in Cuba. Yeah, I, I think they're paying attention and, you know, we don't know what they do. I think in recent months, there's been a lot more focus on Venezuela. The anti-Cuba lobby, together with other neoconservative allies in the U.S., they see this as much more strategic right now, and partly because, you know, Venezuela is sending tens of thousands of barrels of oil to Cuba every day, and they, see, they feel if they get rid of Venezuela, uh, they take out the Venezuelan government, uh, Cuba's going to be a lot weaker. Um, I would also just say on the issue of political repression in Cuba, to the extent that there is political repression in Cuba, I don't really think it's very much in the U.S. interest to focus on it. The United States knows full well that the kinds of so-called political repression that happen in Cuba are child's play compared to the kinds of political repression that happen in places like China, for example, where the United States maintains full diplomatic relations and has, you know, good trading relations. So I don't think that the United States has much to gain by going down the road that you're talking about well, either. Well, let me, let me answer mm -hmm. that. Uh, no, Avi, I, I really disagree. I don't think you should, you really want to qualify what takes place in Cuba by calling it so-called or to the extent. I mean, are you really denying that in Cuba there's huge political repression today? Do you really have, what happens to the ladies in white? They go, they leave their houses, they, tr they chant on the way to church, and, and government organized mobs set upon them. The Cuba 75 has, Cuba political has no, prisoners who the ladies in white were protesting have all been released uh, already. So it's not even really an uh, issue uh, at this point. Really? So why? Uh, it, <laughs> Abby, that's unreal. So, so you're denying that what's happening to the ladies in white is happening at, at these stage by 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 Cuban Americans in Miami at these at, at these videos staged. There are no independent political parties in Cuba. There are no independent labor unions. There is no independent media. There there is no right to to meet. In order to meet at a, at the park, you have to have a card from the secretary from the Ministry of Interior, and you ha only have to be there to discuss baseball. Uh, otherwise, you cannot gather. There's no, there's no freedom so let me, to gather. Let me tell you what the Cubans t told me about this. That there are new openings, new debate. They've just now put a new law where a president can be can serve only for two terms. And then they ask the other question that Avi a bit talked about: is why does America have good relations with all these all these other countries, from Vietnam to China to Saudi Arabia and others, who have similar? situation that America talks about. China has had a great economic opening. What's happened in Cuba, it's not really an economic opening. It's, a, it's barely, it's very cosmetic and it basically it boils down to a recognition of, of the black market, uh, which is, ha has happened for decades. It's the only rational economic system in Cuba. Uh, and, and the only reason they have recognized it is because they want to tax it. I don't think that's really a believable story that U.S.-Cuba policy is based on what they do with their economy. It doesn't really make any sense. What is it based on then? Well, it's part of U.S. foreign policy, and it's a domestic policy thing as well. I mean, as long as Florida is a swing state in the presidential elections, you're going to have a problem. So what you're saying is only politics, mm -hmm. that there is no ideology behind no, the I strategy? Disagree. I disagree. I disagree. There's both of them. Mm -hmm. I, you I know, um, I think it began because Cuba defied U.S. dominance in the Western Hemisphere, and it continues to. Well, that's absolutely true, and it's also true of the U.S. attitude towards Venezuela and all the left governments. The only thing I think that is partly explainable by the Florida aspect of it is the embargo itself. That is, there is a, a certain amount of pressure. They might have, uh, or they might be closer to lifting it if not for that lobby. But you're absolutely right. The overall uh, attitude towards Cuba is the same as the attitude towards every independent uh, left government in the region. That's, they would but, like to get but, rid but of all of but them. But but I, we should also recognize that several very important U.S. sectors that have wanted to be able to sell to Cuba are now able to sell to Cuba, like the agricultural sector. Um, so it's, a, it's not a complete embargo, it's a partial embargo. But um, to the extent that it's necessary to U.S. foreign policy in its 
larger picture to demonize Cuba, it's really important to keep people from going there because once people go there, they're going to see it's not what the U.S. government is telling us it is. Nobody's demonizing the Cuban government. You, you, we ought to be able to call the demon by its proper name. The Cuban government is a highly repressive government that for 50 years has not allowed Internet, you know, internationally recognized human rights standards has not allowed uh, uh, independent uh, uh, independent parties has not allowed a free press does not allow freedom of expression does not allow the freedom to to gather. Why are Cubans any different from anyone else? Cuba is not a place like any other place in the world. I'm sorry to, to say this to you. To the rest of the world, it is. No, Only to the United States, it isn't. I, I, there, but but there is no deny that there is an opening, that there is an economic opening. No, in the there is denying. I am denying it, that there is no, there is no economic opening. I think I'm understanding Mike's argument now. Is He's saying that because China, and maybe Saudi Arabia too, because they have these economic freedoms, that they're going to become uh, less repressive, and therefore the U.S. has good relations. I don't think anybody in the world believes that. I mean... The, the, there's an obvious history and context of our relations with Cuba, which we've all described here, and it's part of U.S. foreign policy towards Latin America. And those are the things that are determining it. It has nothing to do with repression or economic opening. Is there any good reason why Cuba is still on the terrorist list? Cuba doesn't, at one point, provided arms to terrorist groups around the world. It no longer does. Uh, Cuba allegedly uh, supported the ETA, the Basque uh, organization, but they did so under the request of the Spanish government. So even the State Department report on terrorism provided all the rationale that the president would need to take Cuba off. It is not a country anything like the other countries that are on the list, for example, Sudan. Uh, it is not a state sponsor of terrorism. Cuba is a supporter of every bad actor in the world, sharing Cuba intelligence, has power? sharing intelligence with uh, with Assad, Assad Syria, shares intelligence with Iran. Cuba is a friend to every bad regime in the world. That's the arms ships, not, 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 not nuclear ships, arms shipments. That's a first of all, that's different than being a state supporter of terrorism, supporting governments that other governments that might we also have supported. Cuba terrorist supports states. the FARC. Uh, Cuba has given, it provides no arms or assistance to the FARC. What it does is allows members of the FARC to come to Cuba uh, after, for what's called rest and recreation, sometimes medical uh, aid. It's but also, it's also the, as a the government of Colombia is negotiating with the FARC. Uh, as a consequence, so they're able to act as a media. Against the wishes of the majority of the Colombians. Um, the the well, Colombian elected, government the government. is very Cuba, appreciative. Uh, on this issue, they're not support, supporting of these talks. Uh, but, but what does it say that the president shakes hands with the guy he's accusing of terrorism or supporting terrorism? The handshake, I think, was more of a signal to countries in Africa uh, and in Asia. It was in President Obama's interest. Had he not shaken Raul Castro's hand, it would have looked much worse, much like a United States being a bully. I don't think it signified anything positive. I think it was avoiding the negative. The thing I heard in Cuba about this question of uh, American policy is that Perhaps it's, whether it's a pretext or it's a true justification, because of American policy, the Cuban government will have to take certain measures, whether it's on security level, whether it's in terms of not opening enough. And if it only the America or Washington would open up, maybe then change will be a much faster pace in Cuba. Do you agree with that? The more the United States tries to infiltrate and control people in Cuba who are talking about change, the less they are going to be accepted and trusted and the less political openness there is going to be in Cuba. Let's round it up. And I know historians don't like to talk about the future, so let's talk about the history of the future. <laughs> if you look at it a few years down the road, what would we see happening now? Is something is going to give on the question of U.S. and Cuba? Is this going to be the test of American or the America's relations? Well, let's start with some facts that we know are likely to happen. Uh, President Raul Castro will step down from office in 2018. Uh, and the likely person to replace him is Miguel Diaz-Canal. Miguel Diaz-Canal seems to share a, a lot of the same policies. Uh, he's much younger. He is not historical. Uh, so there are also likely to be some changes in Cuba. Are you saying there's a generational factor that's going to be important 
in determining the future relations between the U.S. and Cuba? Absolutely, and it's here too because the, as an Atlantic Council poll in February showed, the younger generation of Cuban Americans are much less antagonistic towards Cuba. They're the people who would like to visit Cuba more. They are more willing to send money to Cuba and they want the United States to change. There's a majority of Hispanic Americans, Americans, and apparently Cuban Americans that want normalization. Of so much Cuba. to say, so little time. Uh, the Atlantic uh, Council poll, if you look into it and read it again, once you tell people the conditions on the ground and we we're actually demanding, then the, the support for continuation of, 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 of demanding changes in Cuba is wide. Uh, let, me, let me give you the parade of horribles of what we're asking the Cuban government to do, and this is codified into law, and that is release of political prisoners, allow internationally recognized standards of human rights, allow political parties, independent political parties, allow a free press, allow... Uh, this, this is the bare minimum of decent society that we're asking the Cuban government to okay. enact. The, the world should be, but the United States says this is the law. So you think more of that changes of the law are, are, are happening, whether you like them or not? Do you think that change is coming I, to I, the U.S. Cuban and U.S. Latin American relations? I love to live the, the, the life that my partners live because they talk about progress and change in Cuba. I, I wish that could be the case. It isn't. Everything that's happened is cosmetic. Uh, there's no there's no recognition of private property. There's no recognition of, of, of independent contracts There's no recognition of the right of people to speak their mind. I wish that these changes were indeed taking place They're just not we 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 going to speak right after this with the Young Cuban director of this latest film Conducta. We're talking about changes problems and solutions uh, uh, for Cuba mm -hmm. by Cubans, but for now RV gentlemen Thank you for joining Thank Empire. You. Despite 50 years of troubled history, 90 miles of choppy waters, and the occasional trading of blows, Cuba has long had a love affair with Americana. Fidel himself knew a thing or two about pitching for glory. And as a U.S. amateur boxing team competed in Cuba for the first time in 27 years, I met with filmmaker Ernesto Daranas, whose new film, Conducta, recently won the best film prize at New York's Havana Film Festival. You seem to concentrate on education in your latest movie, Conducta. Do you think education has deteriorated since you were a child? I think in general, education is in crisis all over the world because these children, these people that live in small towns, in many cases, the only refuge they have is a teacher. Since the failure of society, since the failure of family, since the failure of the economy, in many cases, the only thing that is left for these children is the teacher. If, if, if Cuba opens up, do you think uh, those places that are important for the country and for society, like education and health, do you think they will suffer or they will benefit? It's a really abstract term, thinking of what it will mean for Cuba to open up. Cuba to open up to what? To what things? It's not about change just for the sake of changing. It's about a change in social attitude, a more humanistic approach. Do you think um, Cuba is ready for a major change? The changes that are taking place right now are basically aimed at the economy. These changes are intended to make sure that we don't lose the things that are most essential to us. But the reality is those changes have not reached the poorest parts of the population. Those people are ready for change. We have the training, the education, the health. I believe in those things. That's why this movie that I'm shooting right now... Pink smoke. I haven't wanted my other movies to be humorous because even though we are portrayed as fun people, we laugh so as not to cry. This is the country where soap operas were born. This is also a part of us. If we laugh, 
we laugh a lot. And if we cry, we cry a lot. It seems there is a, a sort of a paradoxical obsession between Cubans and Americans. I think that we have lived through extreme moments in history. We've learned to hate and respect each other. History has been manipulated many times, and it's always the ordinary people, Cubans and Americans, that are caught in the middle. And you seem to have a lot of this in common things. We've been to baseball games, and we've watched boxing and Cuba won. And we see movies, and we see how much that is uh, in common, how much you are also uh, people who watch American movies so much in this country. There's, there's deep, implicit integration already. This is what makes this relationship wonderful. There's a profound knowledge from the Cuban people of the United States, which is based on the essentials, family and friends that we have living over there through their culture, music and movies. The rest is just politics. We also started with the show, and let's end with the show on the following reflection. It seemed that Cuba and America went through three major historical breaks, one after the American and the Spanish, one after the American and the Soviets, and it seems like one between the United States and Latin America in general. Are we now tipping towards a new era between Cuba and the United States? There's been talk announcing a new era for a long time now, that's why the expectations have to be based on reality and goals. The people that I mention in my movies, they're crucial to everything because those are the people that are going to really define the future. That's the future first for us, for the relationship with the United States and the world. So you're optimist about the future? I think so. And I'll be back with a final note. As we round up our journey through the nerve centers of U.S.-Cuban relations, namely Washington, Miami, and of course here in Havana, I am left wondering whether we did solve the mystery of their enigmatic relationship. I shall leave that for you to decide. I am certain of three things. One, people on both sides are ready and eager to move forward. Two, the leaders while hesitant, are perhaps willing to face the music. And three, when there is a will, there is a way, and it does take two to salsa. So is this the cha-cha-cha of change? 